Superb Sports Media, we strive to bring you informative videos about the sports you love. Entertaining you is a part of the art, but more than that, we want to share our love of the game with you. This is our series on the 75 years of the NBA. Join us as I, your host Hookshot Drew, take you down memory lane to revisit the game's greatest moments with the legends of the hardwood and yesterday's greats. We retrace the pivotal moments that led to today's great game. Here are the pantheons of history as we know it. Long before LeBron James, Michael Jordan, and even the great Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, the game of basketball had Mr. Basketball, the original GOAT, George Mikan. Growing up a tall, gangly, nearsighted teenager, Mikan was the last one most would have thought of when thinking of an athlete. Approached by legendary coach Ray Meyer during his rookie coaching year while at the Chicago Archbishop Quigley Preparatory Seminary, try saying that five times fast, Mikan didn't have basketball in his own future. He was hoping to become a priest after thinking about becoming a pianist, lawyer, all kinds of other things. Coach Meyer saw something special with Mikan and was determined to bring it out. You see, George Mikan was somewhat embarrassed about his height and wasn't sure about the idea of playing basketball. With his clumsy frame and poor vision, he was told he wasn't cut out to be a ball player. Before going to Quigley, he attended Juliet Catholic High School, which was much closer to his family's home. But after being run off by their basketball coach and told he would never be able to play basketball with his bad eyes and clumsy coordination, Mikan transferred to Quigley to leave it all behind. It was during one of his summers at Quigley that he grew several inches and started to get a lot of questions about why he wasn't playing for Quigley's basketball team. Mikan was playing city basketball with his brothers, but had no real plans to play organized ball for his school. During this time, George didn't always have a lot of people in his corner, but he certainly had the right people seeing that talent underneath. One of those people who saw something in him was coach Paul Went, who coached and scattered for DuPaul and happened to catch one of his games. Went offered him a scholarship to play basketball for DuPaul. Mike had molded over, considering whether being a priest or a basketball player was the right move. Ultimately, George decided to attend DuPaul, but as a freshman, players in that day weren't eligible to play, so they were used to sharpen up the varsity's teams back then. While playing in a city tournament game, he ran into a fellow young player that was being recruited to play for Notre Dame. One of the Notre Dame scouts was watching the game between the two young guys. Mikan was offered a tryout for Notre Dame, but unfortunately broke his leg during a pickup game and didn't have a great tryout. Notre Dame coach George Kogan told him to go back to DuPaul and become a scholar, as he felt he wasn't cut out for basketball. However, his assistant coach Ray Meyer saw something in the young Mikan and didn't agree with his head coach's assessment. Mikan returned to DuPaul shortly after the trip to Notre Dame, enduring barbs from his teammates and classmates about the failed South Bend tryout. However, after the last varsity game during his freshman season, Coach Paul Went resigned and DuPaul went to work looking for a new head coach. Went had been the first coach that saw something in the young Mikan, but it only got more interesting when DuPaul hired none other than Ray Meyer, the former coaching assistant at Notre Dame, to be the new head coach. This, of course, worried George, as Meyer was there to witness the bad Notre Dame tryout. Ray Meyer immediately put the young DuPaul team on notice as he held a spring practice. This was 1942, so there weren't rules for this kind of thing. And after having a bit of a badass entrance with the taking off the coat in a cool cinematic manner, Meyer addressed the team by telling them none of them were starters and everyone's going to have to earn their spot on the team. From this moment, everything was earned and they were put through the ringer. That first day, plenty of basketball drills, running, going over tactics on both offense and defense. Mikan had blisters and needed his ankle taped after just that first day, but he knew Meyer meant business and that this was the start of something serious. Ray Meyer saw something special within the tall, gangly George Mikan, and he quickly went to work transforming the young Mikan into an all-around great athlete. Using somewhat state-of-the-art training techniques, the legendary Mikan drill was invented for this purpose, Mikan was developed into being able to use hook shots with either his left and right hand, and he was developed into being quick on his feet and dangerous with his power and finesse near that hoop. This was during the time when very tall athletes were seen as too clumsy to be great basketball players. Meyer felt the previous season's varsity center, Frank Wiskins, was a great player but felt with Mikan, the DuPaul team had a strong chance to be a great squad. Meyer and Mikan would work individual drills long after practice ended and the rest of the guys left for the day. Meyer had Mikan work center drills with Wiskins but also used the smallest player on the team, guard Billy Donato, to have Mikan get quicker on his feet and learn how to guard faster and smaller players as well. The results were that Mikan was almost supernaturally quick for a big man, and even though he wasn't that fast down the court as some of the guards, he could still move quick enough to get down court and get back on defense. 
If you watched my last video that led up into this one, the 1951 point shaving scandal, you got some context on how college basketball was played. The NIT tournament was the most important and prestigious championship a college basketball player could hope to win. DuPaul wasn't known for their basketball heritage during this time, but that would change with the bespectacled number 99. Ray Meyer believed George Mikan had the it factor, although he didn't call it that. Meyer described Mikan as being someone who had the innate desire to succeed and had a burning desire to compete and continually improve. Meyer said when he instructed Mikan to do something or change something about his game, he never had to tell him twice, and Mikan was quick to correct flaws. I'm sure others might perceive the it factor differently, but if I was to describe it myself, this is what it would be to me. It takes someone stubbornly determined to be the best and let no one stop them from doing that. It also takes someone who believes in them that can also show them how to get that latent potential out in order for the best results to come from that. I believe Mike can realize meeting Meyer was critical for Mike and to become the basketball player he ended up becoming. One thing we need to keep in mind as we discuss this time period and the great George Mikan is that these were the very early days of basketball. There were far fewer rules in place, especially safety related rules. You see, George Mikan was known for his elbows. He used them particularly well for leverage and his weapons for spacing for his famous hook shot that was nearly indefensible. This also meant Mikan was on the receiving end of plenty of punishment himself. This also meant there were plenty of things going on at this time that were clearly not allowed in our time, but were during this time. A lot of the reason for such is men like George Mikan, who were just so damn unstoppable. One of these things that Mikan was good at was his ability to jump up and block a shot from going into the basket. In today's times, we call this goaltending, and it's an automatic basket for the team affected. But in Mikan's time, it wasn't a rule, and it was mostly due to the majority of players not being able to do it on a regular basis for the need of a rule to be there. Well, needless to say, Mikan's six foot eight frame at DuPaul was doing it often enough that there were grumblings. At DuPaul, Mikan's height and finesse coupled with his non-stop motor and dedication to improving his game made him a college legend and someone worthy of being in the Hall of Fame all on its own. DuPaul University was not known for their basketball, but in the 1942-43 season, that perception would vanish. George Mikan had arrived and basketball would forever be changed. Almost from the beginning, teams had trouble dealing with Mikan's size, power, and finesse near the basket. His offensive game didn't show up right away, but his defensive game was making huge waves. His ability to knock shots out of the top of the hoop was getting under the skin of opposing teams, but it was perfectly legal to do so. DuPaul finished the season with a strong 18-4 record with their sophomore star center, George Mikan. With Illinois rejecting their NCAA and invitation, DuPaul accepted it and used that opportunity to let the sports papers of the day know exactly who the mighty Mikan was and what he was all about. Defeating Dartmouth, Mikan blocked 17 shots in that game before being knocked out in the following round. With an NCAA tournament game win, and went over Kentucky earlier in the season to boot, Ray Meyer knew he had something to build on. Speaking of that win against Kentucky earlier that season, that win may have been one of the most important games in basketball when looked back on. Kentucky was coached by Adolph Rupp, a man I mentioned in the last video. Rupp at this time was seen as the greatest basketball coach ever and had a tremendous influence on the game at the time. When Rupp's team had beaten Notre Dame handily the week before, the Notre Dame coach called DuPaul's coach Ray Meyer afterwards to warn him about their two guards who were as close to automatic as you can get once they were set up for a shot. When Kentucky came to Chicago to play DuPaul, Meyer had a plan for that. Mikan stood under the basket and swatched shots away that came to the basket. Milton Ticko, the best scorer on Kentucky that season, took 21 shots in the game against DuPaul with Mikan swatting away 19 of them. Rupp was said to have immediately removed DuPaul from his team's schedule. He never played DuPaul again and was also said to have used his influence on the NCAA Rules Committee to outlaw the goaltending tactic. This is where the rule we know today originated from. Bob Curlin was a 7-foot center from Oklahoma A&M, today's Oklahoma State, and along with Mikan is considered to be the primary person responsible for the goaltending ban that would be put in place after the 43-44 season. He was also the first major rival in Mikan's career. Oklahoma A&M Aggies were built from their excellent team defense, the centerpiece of it being Curlin and his amazing goal 10 shot blocking ability. Curlin and Mikan had multiple battles, perhaps none grander than their meeting in the second round of the 1944 NIT. The papers hyped up the battle of the skyscrapers. Indeed, Bob Curlin and George Mikan were the best big men in college basketball at the time, so this was an intriguing matchup to be sure. Curlin and Mikan battled back and forth, but the Aggies coach Hank Iba had a plan. Double team Mikan with Curlin in his grill and a forward swarming him. Force Curlin to pass the ball out. 
Curlin was a defensive anchor and wasn't interested in scoring points, so this strategy seemed effective. Curlin and Mikan played physical. Mikan fouled out early in the second half and Curlin shortly after that. DuPaul, however, won 41-38, with Mikan scoring 9 and Curlin at 14. The papers didn't get the exciting game they had hoped for, but the book on how to limit Mikan was now being written. Or so teams believe. As good as the 1944 DuPaul Blue Demons had become, they were beat up and tired from the Oklahoma A&M game, particularly with Mikan. As his bad ankle that got messed up earlier in the season was in a bad way after a physical encounter with Curlin. In the NIT championship game against St. John's, DuPaul was out of gas for the very quick and athletic St. John's team. Mike had fouled out early in the second half and scored only 13 points, and they lost 47-39. Still, being runners-up to the NIT champions wasn't a bad year. For the 44-45 season, a goaltending rule was in effect, and all who followed basketball felt this meant the end of the DuPaul Blue Demons and their star center George Mikan. However, Meyer and Mikan had been hard at work further developing Mikan's game, and when the season kicked off, college basketball soon quickly realized that there wasn't a more unstoppable force in the sport than the man named George. Early on in the season, teams realized that Mikan's inside game had developed to the point where leaving one man on it wasn't nearly enough, and he was consistently double teamed with teams using a high-low double team surrounding him. This aided Mikan's improvement on passing as he learned how to get the ball out quickly to his fleet-footed guards for them to either cut to the basket or make long jump shots. In their home Chicago stadium, Mikan and the Blue Demons beat Curl and the Aggies 48-46 in a very tight matchup of which the Aggies played tough defense, constantly doubling Mikan and daring the rest of the team to score. This game would be the match to start to flame later in the season for this intense rivalry. As the DuPaul Blue Demons team traveled by train all around the World War II era United States, they got strange looks and jeers, as healthy looking men playing sports during wartime was kind of frowned upon. The truth was, everyone on the team had a medical or physical related thing keeping them from fighting, but not everyone was understanding of that. Add in that Mikan was quickly gaining fame as the best player in the country and was consistently beating fans' favorites home team, and you can probably guess where this might go. It was common for fans, especially in rowdier parts of the cities, to throw garbage and heckle the visiting teams, as well as fistfights occurring on the court. This was a very different time in the sport of basketball, and you were expected to be able to handle yourself in those days. Part of the reason I decided on doing this video was to bring awareness to how much the game changed from an entertainment exhibition not treated much differently than boxing or horse racing into a highly organized, almost orchestraic, artistic, athletic experience. And George Mikan had a lot to do with the change in that perspective. Despite opposing teams' newfound respect for Mikan's offensive game, DuPaul remained unstoppable and seemed to adjust to any new defenses thrown at them. DuPaul finished the season 18-2 and was invited to the NIT once again. In the first round of the playoffs, they defeated West Virginia fairly easily and Mikan scored an NIT record 33 points. In the second round, they played against Rhode Island State, who were employing a more modern, fast-running style instead of the slower, more methodical style that was common. They were known to score 100 points a game somewhat easily. To say they were confident was an understatement. They used a 6 foot 2 forward to do the tip off against a 6 foot 9 Mikan. Almost from that moment, it was a blowout. Rhode Island State was certainly running all over the place like some of the papers said they would, but they weren't scoring the basketball. Mikan scored 27 points by halftime. Three minutes into the second half, Mikan was at 33 points. When Coach Meyer went to bench him to show some mercy, a note was slid to him saying, Leave him in. The scoring record for the tournament was 33 points. So Meyer left him in. Mikan quickly scored 41 points, and Meyer once again went to bench Mikan when he got another note saying, Madison Square Garden record is 45 points, so he left Mikan in the game again. The blowout got a little bit embarrassing to the point where Rhode Island State's coach asked his team to hold the ball to not let DuPaul score 100 points, which was Madison Square Garden's team record for points. Being ahead by more than 40 points as it was, Meyer asked his team to stay back. When it was all said and done, DuPaul trounced Rhode Island State 97-53 with Mikan matching the entire Rhode Island State team with 53 points on his own. The NIT Championship round was DuPaul versus Bowling Green, and it was another hyped up big man matchup. Don Otten was a 7 foot center that the papers were hyping up, and telling coach Ray Meyer that Otten was too big and too strong for George Mikan. In the game, Mikan continually used his finesse and quick feet to befuddle the larger Otten. The game was hardly close, and DuPaul won 71-53 on the strength of Mikan's 33 points and Otten's 7. The papers had nothing positive to say, instead running Otten is rotten as their headline, and not even mentioning Mikan in DuPaul's championship winning performance. George Mikan was named NIT MVP of the 1945 NIT Championship.
The DuPaul Blue Demons won the 1945 NIT Championship, afterwards in which they faced rival Oklahoma A&M, the NCAA tournament winners, and a faux national championship charity game. While waiting for the Red Cross National Championship game, the team answered a challenge by a nearby Army base team, in which Mike and DuPaul played a very physical game. A provoked Mike and elbowed a serviceman's face and loosened up six teeth. Unfortunately, the Oklahoma A&M game that followed was apparently not nearly as interesting, as it was considered by most that saw it to be dodgy at best. There were a lot of fouls called, and fans quickly lost interest in it. As the draw was Mike and versus Curlin, and that ship sailed very early on as they both fouled out. The 1945-46 season was an interesting one for the college game, as a lot of men returning from the war attempted to return to their college teams and continue their education. Unfortunately, none of the prior DuPaul players that left for the war made the team, as they were either out of shape or too injured to play basketball. It was also interesting because DuPaul was blowing out everyone, but not getting any respect from the papers. The team finished 19-5 with an average margin of victory of 23 points, but oddly weren't invited to either the NCAA or NIT tournaments. A lot of people think Adolph Rupp of Kentucky had a lot to do with this. All in all, DuPaul went 81-17 over four years with Mikan, with two NIT championship appearance, one win and one runner-up, and an NCAA tournament appearance. Mikan was voted Player of the Year twice and was consensus All-American three times. Mikan felt his greatest accomplishment that season was meeting his wife Pat, marrying her, and beginning a long, happy marriage. But this is only the beginning in the story for a legend the size and bravado of the great George Mikan. This is the era of the barnstorming teams and Mikan was becoming a major draw in the Midwest and New York. Mikan quickly signed up a contract with Maurice White who owned the American Gears of the National Basketball League, a pro basketball team in Chicago. Mikan signed the largest contract in the league marking himself as a target. He gave his first check and signing bonus to his family to pay their debts and embarked on a new journey, professional basketball. Many basketball onlookers would tell you that the college game was far more refined than the pro ranks, as pro basketballers of the day resembled mercenaries more than they did athletes. Fist fights were very common and frequent, and most players had their nose broken and teeth knocked out on multiple occasions. This was a physical game, and referees were not as well trained on what constitutes a foul like they are in modern times. There were also only two referees in the court instead of the three today. Mike had learned very early on that the pro players at this level were tough, mean, and were capable of doing anything to keep playing and win games. There were also many leagues and teams at this time, too many in fact. The Gears were invited to play in the World Basketball Tournament, which was organized by local papers and the goal was to find out who the best team was from the various leagues. Mike had only played in the last few weeks of the 45-46 season, but was still the largest draw in the tournament. The Gears went on to easily defeat their first two opponents, but Mike had fouled out quickly in the third game and the Gears lost. They went to the consolation ladder and won. Mike had scored 100 points in four games and won MVP of the tournament. Gears owner Maurice White was greedy for a championship, and with Mike in growing at further at 6'10 and having more weight on his frame, he was on the move to make something big happen. Even with the World Basketball Tournament, there was a lot of uncertainty about pro basketball and a lot of players that were great in college didn't always continue playing. There were far too many basketball leagues and a lot of them were folding really quickly. Bob Curlin went on to play AAU ball, playing for his company's team. Yes, that was a thing back then. Companies had basketball teams of employees. Bizarre and cool, huh? Money and interest became issues for a lot of leagues, so the teams would sprout out and die just as quick as they came. In 1946, yet another new league hit the scene, the BAA or the Basketball Association of America. They differed from the large NBL and other leagues in that the owners had money. They were the hockey league owners and typically owned their large arenas. They formed the BAA to fill the dates for their large arenas. This is a stark contrast to the NBL which used high school and auditoriums in the suburbs like Rochester and Fort Wayne to play their games. Having bear all that in mind, you'll quickly find out that the Gears owner, Maurice White, was a real piece of work, as they might say. Heading into the 46-47 season, battle lines were drawn between the BAA and the NBL, as although the NBL had the better players, the BAA had the large arenas. Nowhere was the fight between the two organizations bigger than in Chicago, where the BAA had the Chicago Stags, who were playing in the Chicago Stadium. The American Gears, on the other hand, were playing in the American Amphitheater, a much smaller venue that was holding a livestock show for the first few weeks of the season, forcing the Gears to hit the road for the first few weeks. This wasn't good for the Gears, as the Stags had multiple games of large crowds in the stadium before anyone got to see the Gears and their star player George Mikan. Despite the disadvantage in early going, Gears owner Maurice Smith knew he had George Mikan. 
who by this time was probably already the largest star in basketball. However, when the Gears finally returned home for their season opener, Smith Money. called Mike into his office to inform him that he was having issues with money and in a pretty damn rude way told Mike and he needed him to take a pay cut. George was already cantankerous as earlier in the week Smith Wait a minute! cut four players from the team including George's older brother Joe without any warning at all. George flatly refused to take the pay cut quitting the team and sending the two parties to court. Gears owner Maurice Smith and George, Mike, and sued each other, which motivated George to finish his law degree later on. They had a very nice and friendly judge who presided over the case and had them make up and put it up behind them. The suits were withdrawn and Mike returned to the Gears after missing 19 games. The Gears were struggling without Mike, but as of late had been improving as owner Maurice Smith. I'm like no! God! No! God! Please, no! No! had found himself a good player coach, Bobby McDermott. McDermott was a perfect coach for the job as his tough playing style and hard living meshed with the Gears players. McDermott was known to be the hardest player on the team in the night scene, staying up all night drinking beers and smoking cigars, but still dropping 30 points in games the next day. He was as tough as nails and not afraid to knock an opposing player out cold in the middle of a game. Imagine a coach these days being like this, let alone also playing in the game. With Mike and back in their lineup, the Gears caught fire and managed to make the playoffs. They were undefeated at home in the season. The Gears were a well-balanced team as Coach McDermott liked all of the starters to get baskets and keep the defenses honest against all of them. They played Oshkosh in the playoffs, a team that had beaten them six straight times during the season. But the Gears won narrowly 61-60 with Mike scoring 22 points. In the championship round, they played the Rochester Royals in a best of five series. Rochester won the first game, with Mike and fouling out early, but the Gears won the next three straight, winning the NBL championship. Mike was the leading scorer of the NBL, 16.5 points per game in 25 games, and in the playoffs he upped that up to 19.7 points per game. Meanwhile, their BAA cross-city rivals, the Chicago Stags, were runners up to the first BAA champion, Philadelphia Warriors, and in the process cemented the BAA as a top basketball organization. The BAA was already seen as an equal to the NBL, despite the NBL having the better players. One man who didn't seem to understand the newfound situation, however, was Gears owner Maurice White. Giddy with his team winning the championship and eager to replicate the success many more times, White went straight to work scheming. He noticed that the Gears not only had the best attendances by far of any team in the NBL, but he also noticed that other teams had their best gates and attendance figures going up against the Gears. He determined that the Gears were the biggest team in basketball and that George Mikan was the largest star in all of basketball. He called George Mikan into his office to inform him that he was starting his own league and that the Gears were going to be the centerpiece of this new league. Mikan told him that he thought this idea wasn't a great one, but White kicked him out of his office and set to work. Using a lot of his own money, White started the league, adding 16 teams from St. Paul to Birmingham, Alabama. He handled everything himself as a commissioner, from player salaries to transportation. Within a few weeks, the new league folded, with almost no attendance and dwindling funds. White lost his mind and had to enter a hospital for treatment. The Gears tried to re-enter the NBL, but the other teams declined. Within months, the Gears went from NBL champions, to the centerpiece of a new league, to having no team at all. The gears were dismantled and the players were grabbed up by different teams. I mean, let's examine this for a second. Imagine one man having this much power to change things like this. This quite easily could have been the end of Mike. George wanted to return to law school and finish up his law degree as the previous season's long and arduous journey had shown him the value of knowing the legal system. Max Winter, general manager of the newly formed Minneapolis Lakers, gave George Mikan a call, letting him know that his services belonged to the team. Mikan scoffed and said he didn't belong to anyone, as the gears folded and he was without a contract. Winter was a smooth talker who knew he needed George Mikan to really turn the Lakers into a fine team. The Lakers had formed when the owners bought out the Detroit Gyms, the previous season's worst team in the NBL. Mikan decided to hear the Lakers out, and after some negotiating, they included getting a loss on purpose in order to show Mike in the city and causing them to miss their flight back home. Penn was set to paper, and Mikan was going to be playing on the Twin Cities' first professional sports team. 
When Ben Berger and Maurice Chaflin purchased the Detroit Gems, they got little more than the franchise rights and some ratty old uniforms. All of the players were assigned to other teams by the NBL. Even with drafting Mike in first in the dispersal draft for the Gears, the Lakers had to build a team from scratch. Fortunately, the new Lakers group seemed to have a strong eye for talent, as awaiting Mike in when he joined the team was newly signed former AAU player Jim Pollard. Pollard was one of the AAU's brightest stars. Using his leaping ability, in which he earned the nickname Kangaroo Kid, Pollard was one of the first above the rim type players, using his hops to play above other teams and get baskets. Along with nailing the Pollard signing, the Lakers took a chance and hired John Cunliffe, who had coached St. Thomas and St. John and would be the youngest professional sports coach at 31. He had turned down the offer three times and wasn't the Laker group's first choice, but at the recommendation of Winter and others, the Lakers offered him twice the salary he had at St. Thomas in order to coax him away. When Mikan began playing his first season for the Lakers, by the way, just one week after the collapse of the Gears and the defunct new league, mind you, the Lakers had already played three games and didn't have Mikan's gear ready. For his first game in a Lakers uniform, it really wasn't. Using a too small jersey with the number 21, because his number 99 wasn't ready yet, and his Gears shorts, which were pretty much still brand new, George Mikan ushered in a new era of basketball to America. It wasn't the smoothest of starts, however, as Mikan's new Laker teammates seemed to force feed him the ball down low, knowing his star power and production from his time with the Gears and DuPaul. Most teams saw that play style coming a mile away, and it often meant Mikan had very little room to work with and often fouled out of the games early. It took several games for the Lakers to gel, but oh boy, gel they did. With great players like Jim Pollard and Herm Schiefer, the Lakers had a strong core of players that could play around Mike and strengths. The early days of the Lakers were hardly as glamorous as you see today, where the Los Angeles Lakers play at the Staples, I guess now a Crypto.com arena. No matter what day of the week you tune in, you see the stars of Hollywood throughout the audience. No, these Minneapolis Lakers certainly paid their dues in the early going. The Lakers group led by Max Winter had to make more money on their own, and a lot of that time, and that usually meant filling up their basketball schedule when they weren't playing scheduled NBL games. This meant a lot of barnstorming. The idea of barnstorming in sports may be mostly dead at this stage in our society, but this is how professional basketball subsisted primarily before the days of television revenue. The Harlem Globetrotters during the late 1940s were the most popular basketball team in the country, and a predominantly black basketball team at that. Owned by Ape Cyperstein, I hope I'm saying that right, the Globetrotters are still one of the only barnstorming teams today. Mike can play the likes of the Harlem Globetrotters many times as a member of the Minneapolis Lakers, only losing their very first two matchups. The Globetrotters-Lakers rivalry did a lot to add popularity to this sport. Although the Lakers' continuing dominance over the Globetrotters did put a stop to their meetings before Mikan's fifth year with the Lakers. Local hometown crowds love booing the giant George Mikan and the Lakers anytime they arrived, as they did very little losing. Garbage and broken glass were often seen on the court at end of games. Basketball was a different animal during these times, and Mikan had a lot to do with the eventual civilized nature join in the game. The first year Lakers not only played their NBL scheduled games, but barnstorming against great teams like the Globetrotters in the World Basketball League Tournament, this was the last year it was held, helped sharpen the new Lakers team for the NBL Championship Tournament, which the Lakers quickly overmatched all, including their rivals the Rochester Royals for their NBL Championship. Their first year, Lakers went from worst to first. Mikan led the NBL in scoring for the second year in a row, setting new records and scoring over 21 points a game. In case George Mike and star power is still in question to this point, I will quickly recap his career that he had up to this point. His career at DuPaul included NIT tournament win, NIT runner-up, NCAA tournament appearance with one win in the tournament, and remember DuPaul was far from a basketball powerhouse prior to Mike and, and two NBL championships with two scoring titles and two years being a professional. At this point he was possibly the most decorated basketball player ever and a bona fide ticket seller. So much so that basketball itself was seesawing based on who had Mike in. The NBL as previously mentioned was the old school league that used barnstorming and small arenas to sell tickets. It had the bigger names and star players. The BAA, on the other hand, had big arenas and played in big cities, with their owners having the big money from owning a hockey team in their own arenas. While the first year Lakers were working on their NBA All Championship season, the BAA was hard at work working a deal to take away two of the NBA's top teams. 
Fort Wayne and Indianapolis to add to their growing league. The Lakers group knew that if that happened, the NBL would eventually fold. They made a deal with the BAA to leave the NBL along with the Rochester Royals, and the BAA gained four strong teams. Initially, the BAA had no interest in the Lakers, being that they were in Minneapolis, where the prevailing thought was that it wasn't a profitable sports town. The BAA figured the NBL would fold anyway, and one of their big market teams would pick up Mikan. Through the Lakers group's shrewd negotiation, coupled with the idea of getting Mikan now in an emerging sports city, changed the course of history. Mikan and the Lakers were now members of the BAA, which had some unique differences from the NBL. Games were now 48 minutes long instead of 40. This also meant that George Mikan had the opportunity to play against his brother Ed Mikan and the professionals. Ed Mikan played for the Chicago Stags, the cross city rival of the Gears from George's time in the NBL, but now being in the same league, they were finally able to match up for the first time since their college practices together at DuPaul. The Lakers were immediately a juggernaut in the BAA, and the Chicago Stags were a fine team. The first time they met, the Lakers were 3 and 4, and the Stags had yet to lose a game. The papers had a field day hyping up the Mikan vs. Mikan game. George's relentlessness and no mercy for even his own brother aided in a gritty 85-81 Laker win, with George Mikan scoring 20 points and Ed scoring nothing. DuPaul students that attended that game, they booed George harshly, as he apparently mauled his brother Ed and left him battered and bruised. George's defense for his physical play on his own little brother? We won by four points. If I were to let him even score five points, they would have won. No mercy. The Lakers' BAA season in 48-49 felt like the changing of the guards, with their star center Mike and locked in a fierce scoring battle with Philly Warriors' Joe Falks. Even back then, absurd trade rumors floated around, as the Lakers and Warriors had to shrug off trade rumors all season long. But the modern excitement for basketball stars was already beginning to button. The Lakers with Mike and the Royals with Arnie Risen and the Warriors with Joel Falks, fans were scanning the sports column in the newspaper for the latest stats and clamoring any time these larger-than-life athletes came to town. With Mike in as a pivot and the offense of Jim Pollard and Don Carlson playing off of him, the Lakers finished the 48-49 season strong with the second-best record in the BAA, one game behind division rival the Rochester Royals. Mike had stated in his book, Unstoppable, the story of George Mikan, that it was a shame that the Royals and Lakers were in the same division, which meant they could never match up for the championship series, as he felt most of his time in the NBA, the Royals were the other best team. Come playoff time, the Lakers glided past the Stags and Brother Ed 2-0, the rival Royals and Ryzen 2-0, where they met the Washington Capitals in the BAA Finals. Listen, for a nerd like me, this right here is a wet dream. The 48-49 BAA Finals is a historic series from so many different angles. Right here is the last championship before the NBA became the NBA. Right here is the genesis, the preamble to the legendary Lakers-Celtics rivalry. Right here is essentially where our modern NBA timeline begins. Red Auerbach was the coach of the Capitals, yes that Auerbach, the coach who won a million championships with the Celtics, and here he was staring down at the biggest star in the sport and George Mikan with the buzzsaw that is the Minneapolis Lakers that was carefully constructed to use Mikan with his biggest strengths while also being insulated from teams trying to use too many resources to defend Mikan. The Lakers cruised to a quick 3-0 series lead over the feisty hour back and the Bullets, but in Game 4, Mikan crashed onto the floor after a rebound, and although he was unaware at the time, he broke his arm. Auerbach allegedly said, drag him off the court and let's get this game going, to which Auerbach replied to that alleged statement, bullshit, I didn't say that. Mike was too good, he didn't need any more help. Which to me is similar to Rick James saying, he didn't grind his feet on the couch with Charlie Murphy, but then he immediately said, he may have grinded his feet on his couch because he could have gotten another one. With Mike and playing hurt, the Lakers dropped that game and the next one, but game six was at St. Paul and Mike with a broken arm Knocked in 9 baskets and hit 11 of 12 free throws with a broken arm, and the Lakers became champions of two leagues in two years. Mike and himself won his third scoring title in three years, and his team was champions of the league he played in for the third straight year. The Lakers were just getting started. The 49-50 season brought in the new era of basketball. Well, the name at least. The BAA 
NBL merger finally happened as the BAA gobbled up so much of the basketball market share by running the big arenas and big stars, perhaps none more impactful than Mikan. Mikan's first year with the Gears was the long fuse that set this whole thing off as the BAA went from a 12-team league to a 17-team league with the merger. A big part of the merger's timing was the formation of the Indianapolis Olympians, which featured a big chunk of the legendary Kentucky team that won gold at the 48 Olympics and back-to-back -back NCAA titles. Alex Groza and Ralph Beard, in particular, were seen as huge pickups for the NBL, and it was great timing, as the BAA had just acquired the Indianapolis Jets. The NBA has its fair share of twists and turns to get to where it is today, because Olympians and Jets don't exist in the NBA, but this right here was ultimately the move that hastened the inevitable. The Olympians would go on from a strong, promising team in the fledgling NBA to gone in a few years, as the aforementioned 1951 point shaving scandal saw both Alex Groza and Ralph Beard banned from the NBA from life, with the concept of the Olympians pretty much shot from there. The Lakers group, on the other hand, continued to show their eye for talent with three Hall of Fame rookies in the first NBA season. The Lakers were not done innovating either. The first NBA season, you know, by name anyway, saw the creation of a new position, the power forward. Well, sort of. Forwards existed already, sure, but power forwards, or the idea of a rim-facing big man, was not something that previously existed. That was until the Lakers drafted center Vern Mickelson out of Hamline. At Hamline, Mickelson built himself a commendable career and was a two-time All-American. He initially wasn't sold on the idea of pursuing basketball, especially with the already legendary Mike and Manning the center position. Max Winter and John Cunla sold him the little white lie that Mike was going to retire soon, and the prospect of him learning behind Mike sold him on the idea of seeing how it would turn out. Cunla tinkered around with getting Mike and Mickelson on the court at the same time, as Mickelson's scoring and rebounding was also among the league's best. In order to create space for both large human beings, Cunla had Mickelson face the basket out towards the perimeter, which was a big adjustment for the classic back to the basket score that Mickelson had grown accustomed to being. This adjustment and subsequent success led to the creation of what we know today as a power forward position. Using Mickelson and Mikan's talents and some genius coaching adjustments, the Lakers were able to have a very powerful defensive front line while also having elite scoring capabilities. As if that wasn't enough of an innovation, the Lakers had two other impressive, unassuming rookies. The first of which was Speedy Slater Martin out of Texas. It took time for Cunla to get the best out of Martin's gifts, so his numbers were not exactly mind-blowing his rookie year. But later on in his career, he'd become one of the most effective slashers to the basket, as well as a long-range jump shooter. His playmaking and court vision ability stood out, as he was certainly one of the cliché, ahead-of-his-times, prototypical type players. The last Hall of Fame rookie was one that kind of wasn't, at least not in basketball. Harry Bud Grant was drafted in town from the University of Minnesota, and the Lakers used his Bulldog on-ball defense to clamp down on opposing scoring threats. Grant only played two years, but earned himself a ring in the NBA as a player. He went on to become a Hall of Fame NFL coach for the Minnesota Vikings, long before the days of Deion Sanders or Bo Jackson, or potentially Kyler Murray if we could ever be so lucky. With the addition of Mickelson, the Lakers found the right mix to build their dynasty. One of the many strengths of the Lakers during the 1950s was a powerful frontline big men, and one of the many changes that the game made to stop the Lakers' dominance was the lane, or painted area, being widened from 6 feet to 12 feet. The narrow lanes meant it was hard for teams to get near the basket, with Mikan and Mickelson blocking sunlight to the basket. On offense, no one could stop Mikan and his mighty elbows from getting up shots. If you stayed tight on him with multiple players, he would swing out to one of his great jump shooting guards. If you played him loose, he would go up with his immense power and get easy buckets. In the first two years of the NBA Finals, the Lakers were champions without much of a fuss. With strong teams fielded by stars, this would set the tone for finals for the decades to come. The Olympians in 49-50 led by Groza was a powerful team, but when handed the ban sanction, it led to other teams like the Royals and Capitals to take up the mantle. Names like Paul Horizon, Ed Macaulay, Bob Cousy and Neil Johnson came from these days, but they all fell to the Lakers, who year by year seemed to add to an even more awe-inspiring run of success in professional basketball. In 49-50, the Nationals led by Dolph Shays fell first, but in 50-51, Mike and breaking his leg in the playoffs gave the Royals their first and only championship. However, for the next three years, from 52 to 54, it was all Lakers for the championship. 
All in all, George Mikan won five championships in six years with the Lakers. In seven full professional seasons, six ended in championships. Mikan had four scoring titles and two rebounding titles, although rebounds were recorded as an official stat late in his career. I abbreviated this stretch of his career simply because the Lakers really were that dominant and also because this video is stretching long as it is. But I think by now you're understanding the impact that Mikan had. The championships just further validated his importance. There were some interesting things that happened during this stretch. Again, the Lakers were unstoppable and a lot of it had to do with Mikan's game. All kinds of strategies were tried, including just keeping the ball away from Mikan. For instance, on November 22nd, 1950, one of the most egregious examples of keeping the ball away from the opposing star player occurred. The Fort Wayne Pistons came to town to play the Lakers, and they had a plan to stop the mighty Mikan. They were going to stall as long as possible before scoring. Without a shot clock, the Pistons stood around all game, passing the ball around any time Laker players got close, who were told to stay back and play defense by their coach. Fans hated it, and the final score ended up being 19-18. Yes, the final score was 19-18. Needless to say, George Mikan was certainly changing basketball. The Lakers' long-term success with Mikan as a centerpiece gave future sports dynasties a measuring stick on how to build success around a star player. It didn't take long before the 50s and 60s Boston Celtics similarly built their talented star center, Bill Russell. Using a bevy of talented players that were stars in their own right, the Celtics played around Russell's strengths in much of the same way the Lakers played around the strengths of Mikan. The combination of Mike and size and finesse and willingness to always improve his game meant he became adept for his size at not only scoring and rebounding, but passing and defense as well. The NBA during its early years was hardly an organization that you would call organized and structured. They were the result of a very tumultuous merger between two basketball organizations that were far from sure things. One of these companies had been around for a long time, but employed small arenas and barnstorming events to make their money, and the other company was new, but its major owners were successful businessmen that came from hockey leagues and other successful sports ventures. They had employed large arenas for their games, but left out barnstorming and other exhibition games to make their money. They also didn't seem to mind spending more money for better players and more money for traveling players. Many basketball organizations had come and gone in the short time George Mikan was in the game of basketball. Mikan had a lot to do with where the future of the sport was headed, and Mikan was fully aware of that. He won every scoring title and championship available in whatever league he was in, and the business seemed to follow the direction wherever the mighty glasses wielding sportsmen went. It all goes back to the day Mikan met his sports hero, the babe himself, the Sultan of Swat, Babe Ruth. It was from winning a marbles tournament of all things. Imagine meeting your hero from a Babe Ruth tournament or something. <laughs> But that meeting meant the world to Mikan. When the Associated Press released their list of the best athletes of the first half of the 1900s and 1950, George Mikan was happy to see Babe Ruth chosen as Mr. Baseball. His jaw nearly hit the ground when he saw George Mikan, Mr. Basketball, chosen near the man he idolized. Mikan valued this as one of his proudest accomplishments. Long after the mighty George Mikan retired from the hardwood, he continued to find basketball sneaking into his life. Mikan kept himself busy after his playing days were over, but basketball kept finding itself eventually. Some investors had pulled together enough money to start up yet another basketball league, except this time it was to go head to head with the NBA. Even before anything was signed and official, the goal was to eventually force or merge a buyout with the NBA, as they felt there was room for more cities and more basketball in the ever more connected 1960s US. Mike had turned down the ABA commissioner gig more than once. He knew nothing was official until they were able to get the teams, the cities, arenas, and the players. He also knew they needed television deals and merchandising. When things seemed more legit and he had the contract he wanted, Mike agreed just 10 minutes before the ABA's first public announcement. Under Mikan's leadership, the ABA had some new takes on basketball. A three-point line, Mikan gave credit to Globetrotters from his barnstorming days for that one. The red, white, and blue basketball, Mikan believed it would make the ball more visible to fans far back in the arenas, as well as be a hot seller, and it was. The ABA were also big on putting emphasis on their top stars being so important, encouraging and aiding them into endorsements and sponsorship deals. Eventually, the ABA did merge with the NBA, and several of their top stars went on to have huge Hall of Fame careers in the NBA, and the ABA itself still shows some of its influences today. George Mikan also unsuccessfully ran for Senate, but he had one less salvo up his sleeve for the game of basketball. After the Lakers left Minnesota for the sunny skies of Los Angeles, the Minneapolis-St. Paul Metroplex was left without a basketball for many years. 
That changed when Mikan was approached to help lead a task force to bring another NBA team to the area. In 1989, that became a reality as the Minnesota Timberwolves were formed along with three other new NBA teams. We must never forget those that paved the way for those that are great today. George Mikan's contributions to basketball can never be duplicated. The right man at the right time in all of the right places. From dimly lit auditoriums to sold out packed major arenas with TV production, Mikan brought the game of basketball to immense heights. Please feel free to share this video with anyone you know is a basketball fan as we can't let the legend and legacy of George Mikan ever be forgotten. If you enjoyed this video and would like to learn more, I recommend reading Mikan's book, Unstoppable, The Story of George Mikan. This was an incredible read and contained a lot of the information that I used in this video. Please like, comment, and subscribe if you learned anything about the game of basketball and hit the bell icon if you don't want to miss future videos like this one. I am Hookshot Drew and I appreciate you spending your time learning about the beautiful game of basketball with me today. This is Superb Sports Media and we will continue to feed your sports mind with more.